finding their places. Take your hymn book and turn to page 533, He Lives. 
made the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb. Looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, Do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. Great good conceal in the 
uh, today is Easter Sunday. You all know that. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. But uh, we take up an offering for missions right here in the United States on this day. Uh, our goal this year is $1,000. And you can see it on these posters right here. And we have a mission march. Now, folks, if you didn't come prepared to give, we don't expect you to come up here and act like you do. It's okay. If you came prepared to give, we're going to have our mission march right now. You just come by, put it right there. That is designated for missions in the United States. Not right here, but all over the United States. So Miss Carol's going to play while we do that. <laughs> that we've got missionaries all over the United States I would be glad to let's pray over that father we realize what we put in the offering plate you can magnify and we ask you to do that that money is going to missionaries right here in the United States who's doing your work some of them planning churches some of them trying to reestablish churches that have already been there and father we pray that you take every bit of this and glorify your name with it we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> we could pass the plate, and if we didn't get enough, we pass it again until we do. <laughs> uh, just a little bit of information before we get into the sermon. Uh, Wednesday night at our business meeting, we voted to start a building fund because we're looking we'll look around you that's why so uh, we're asking you uh, pray about that what the Lord have you give and brother Ron Prozel who is our financial secretary going to get together and figure out exactly how we can do that and make it easy for you uh, it's like the pastor told his congregation one time, we have the money to build our new building. And everybody cheered. He says, it's still in your pockets. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not going to say that, but I think you get the under. But we so appreciate you have blessed our hearts. This congregation has today. It really has. The, the children singing, uh, every part of it has. Take your Bible and turn to John chapter 20. We've been studying the Gospel of John, but we're not quite to this point, so we're going to jump ahead and look at this text of Scripture because it talks about the empty tomb. And I preached a lot of different sermons and mentioned and talked about the resurrection, but I've never went verse by verse through this passage. So John chapter 20, verses 1 to 18 will tell us exactly what happened on that day. Now this is from John's perspective. Matthew is different. The other gospel writers are a little different. Folks, they were different people. Different people see things differently and yet the Spirit of God inspired these words. So let's begin with verse 1 of John chapter 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the disciple, to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple went forth and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first and stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. 
And so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, and my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came, announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time. Father, we commit ourselves to you. This is your word. I pray you would have it do exactly what you designed it to do. Encourage your people, bless your people, and glorify you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We pick up in this chapter and see that Jesus is dead. I told you the story of the tribe in Papua New Guinea when the missionary came there and they did not have a written language and he developed a written language for them and then began translating the Bible into that language. And as he did so, he told them the gospel beginning with Genesis and going right through to the book of Revelation. Well, they loved it. The whole tribe came together every evening to hear him teach. Fifty-two people. When he got to the gospels, man, they loved Jesus. Look at the stuff he could do. He could walk on water. He took a little bit of food, fed a great multitude. He could heal by a touch. He became their hero, but they got angry when they killed him. But the missionary said, and he read this passage. He's not here. It is risen. And one by one, the people in that tribe stood up and said in their language, this is true. This is true. And folks, this is true. This is very true. So Jesus is dead. Guards have been placed. A stone is rolled over the tomb. And all seems as well as could be possible. Of course, the followers of Jesus, the disciples and the others, are mourning for his passing because they think life is going to go back to what it was before he came on the scene. That's what's running through the minds of those who knew and loved Jesus. But the scriptures testify, and I am here to testify to you, that it, once you meet Jesus Christ, nothing else is ever normal again. As I mentioned, and I think it was Patsy Claremont who said, normal is a setting on your dryer. That's as normal as it gets. If you're a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, normal doesn't exist. Every day is a new and exciting experience. No matter what you do, you're never by yourself. You're never alone. These followers of Jesus has forgotten much of what he said. They're in a position to be amazed and perhaps even shocked. Why? This one they saw crucified, beaten, mocked, spit upon, ridiculed, and killed will again walk among them. So this morning, we're just going to walk through this passage and consider the details of what those who were present saw at the empty tomb. There's four details in this account that will help us remember 
if we ever forget the resurrection of Jesus. And it'll also help us see perhaps for the first time that Jesus is real and he died for people like you and me. Let's consider the first detail, and I've just did this in questions. Number one, you see it in verse one. When did the resurrection take place? What does it say? It says, and I put this question, did the resurrection take place early in the morning? And I will tell you, no, it did not. Why? That is when Mary found the tomb empty. He, was, he did not just come out. He had been out. The tomb was already open. Early in the morning, probably before sunrise. And notice what the text says. Now on the first day of the week. It was early morning on the first day of the week. The word day there is translated improperly. It's the word Sabbath. It's the word Sabbath. Well, you say, what are you talking about? The first day of of the week of the Sabbath. I mentioned this morning there were three Sabbaths the day that Jesus, or the week that Jesus was crucified. The word Sabbath is plural. It should be Sabbath. So of course, what is, it, what is, what is John trying to get us to see? Well, from the time of Passover to the time of Pentecost are how many days? Five, Fifty days. And how many weeks is that? Well, seven times what? is 49. 7 times 7 is 49. See, I went to school. I couldn't even multiply. So there's seven Sabbaths between Passover and Pentecost, and this is the first of the Sabbaths that wind up on a Saturday. You can read about that in Leviticus 23, verses 15 through 17. So tell your friends and neighbors, ask them how many Sabbaths were in the week Jesus was crucified. Three, and I talked about that this morning. I'm not going to go over it again for the sake of time. Three Sabbaths, the one immediately preceding the day he was crucified, which was the first day of Passover. The day right after that, and you can look at your Jewish calendar and see this, the day right after that was the first day of the Feast of First Fruits, which was considered a Sabbath. So you got two Sabbaths right next to that. And then you got the Saturday Sabbath, three Sabbaths. And see, the scripture verifies all this in the fact that the women could not anoint his body until when? Sunday. And they came and he wasn't there. That's why Mary's so upset. She can't do what she planned to do. This was going to be her last thing she did for her Lord. And he wasn't there. Now, this empty tomb tells us some very important things. Now, Mark mentions the stone was very large. When I read that passage this morning, the stone was very large. This stone was too heavy for a mortally wounded man to move it. That's one of the theories, you know, to explain away the resurrection. Oh, he, he just passed out, and he came to and moved a ton rock out of the way. That doesn't even fit. Josh McDowell tells us that it could have weighed but somewhere between 500 and 2,000 pounds. Now, I'm pretty healthy, but I don't believe I can move a 500-pound rock. And Jesus was, if he, if, 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 I'm saying this, if he had just passed out, there's no way he could do it. So the only obvious observation is what? Someone else moved it. Someone else moved it. Who moved it? Well, it tells us right here. Mary, after everyone else left, looks down because you had to stoop over. It was a, the hole to get into the cave was down on the ground. And she stoops and looks in and sees two angels, one at the head and one at the feet. Other accounts say the angel moved the stone aside and sat on it. What does that imply? That he has very much power. God has given him power to move that stone out of the way and then sit down on it like it's nothing. But my question as I read through this passage is, why move the stone? If he wasn't in there, why move it? Well, the obvious answer is to show the world that the tomb is empty. He's not there. You could go in and sit down and... And waller around if you wanted to. That's a southern word. Waller. You could go in and see. There's nobody here. There's not even evidence of somebody being here. 
But when did the resurrection take place? It took place sometime before sunrise on Easter morning, probably shortly after sundown on the day before. Let's go on to number two. Verses two to four ask, or answer the question, who were the first witnesses to the empty tomb? Now, this is John's account. The other gospel accounts differ here. But who were the first witness in this account here? Number one, Mary Magdalene. Now, listen, if you're a fan of Dan Brown, listen very closely to me. Dan Brown writes fiction. You know what that means? It ain't true. That's what it means. And the Da Vinci Code that describes the person sitting right to Jesus' right in Da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper, he says is Mary Magdalene. You know what the Greek word for that is? No, it isn't. It's the Apostle John who was the youngest. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. He was the youngest one. Mary Magdalene, in spite of what Dan Brown says, and he says it the first of his book. It's a work of fiction. It's not true, but let's go on up with him. She was from the city of Magdala. In Luke verse two, uh, chapter 8, verse 2, Jesus cast out seven demons from her. We don't have that actual account, but we do have the past tense. She, listen to this. She was one of the women who supported the work of Jesus out of her finances. You didn't know that, did you? Did you know that his ministry was financed mostly by women? You know that. Why? Or Dr. Alan Tomlinson at Midwestern Seminary says, you would not believe in the first century how many women, single women who had been widowed, were very wealthy. And Mary Magdalene was obviously one of those. She loved Jesus very much. She came and found Peter and said, they have taken my Lord. And I, don't you like that? They have taken away my Lord and I don't know where they put him. I've often asked myself, who is the they? Who was she thinking was the they? But who's the other person? Simon Peter, we've already mentioned him. He's my favorite disciple because I'm just like him. A fisherman from Galilee. Now, I'm not from Galilee. And I don't even know that I'd call myself a fisherman. I fish at it. But anyway, he was impulsive. He was loud. He was outspoken. But in spite of all of his faults, God had great plans for this man. And once Mary tells him the news, he's one of the older disciples. He runs to the tomb. However, John is younger, so he outruns him. And he too... Both of them come probably because he's younger than Peter. But who's the third person? Well, I just mentioned his name, John, and he calls himself the disciple that Jesus loved. Now, why does he do that? Is he implying that Jesus didn't love the other one? No. He was very close to the Lord. Very close. Probably the youngest of Jesus' followers, very close to Jesus, and this is what's amazing about this young man. He wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And he wrote the Revelation of Jesus Christ, the last book in the Bible. And he too runs to the empty tomb. So that's the people. And we know a little bit about them, not, a, not much, but we're going to learn some more about them. The third question, what was inside the empty tomb in verses 5 to 9? John arrives first. He stoops down and looks in. And what does he see? The linen wrappings were laying there just like a body had been in them, but there was no body in them. It was evident it was empty. The body was gone. But John does not go in. He waits for Peter. Peter then arrives, and he doesn't just look. This is the impulsive part of Peter. What does he do? He crawls into the tomb, and he sees the same thing as John did, but with one difference. Jesus' head covering was rolled up. Some of the other accounts say folded. I mentioned this morning. You know the significance of that? 
I read it and I said, well, that's good. Jesus got up, took the thing off of his face and folded it up. That's not all there is to the story. You see, in the first century when a master was eating supper or whatever meal it was and his slave was waiting on him, he would have a napkin much like we do and that napkin would be beside his plate. Now, if he happened to be finished with his meal, he would wipe his hand and his mouth and then he would wad the napkin up and throw it down. That means what? I'm finished. So the slave knew he could come and clean up and then he could eat himself. That's not what happened. It's rolled up carefully. What happened when the master folded his napkin and got up? It told the slave, don't clean up. I'm coming back. Isn't it amazing? Every little detail in this tells us He's coming back. His head curving was rolled up. It was not with the other wrapping. As if someone had taken the time to roll it up or fold it up and place it somewhere. And then John decides to come in. And he sees the things Peter sees. And don't, did you read that? Did you catch it when I read it? And he believes. What does he believe? Did he believe that Jesus was dead? Well, yeah, no doubt about that. What did he believe? Then he remembered. It started coming back to it. Oh, yeah, I remember. He said, three days and three nights, and I'm getting out of here. And that's exactly what happened. Yet Peter and Mary are not sure because the Scripture says right here, they forgotten or they did not remember what the Scriptures say. Psalm 16, verse 10, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. And I read this interesting tidbit just several weeks ago. Scientists say that after three days, the body starts to decay. God's timing is perfect. Perfect. But in verses 10 to 18, what are the responses to the empty tomb? Well, notice verse 10. So the disciples went away to their own homes. They just went home. Some are going to just go home. They're going to leave this service today, and they're just going to go home. They're not going to think about this. They're not going to reason about it. They're not going to pray about it. They're not going to rejoice about it. They're just going to go home. And others, like Mary Magdalene, will grieve. She's weeping. Mary wept because she didn't understand where Jesus was. She stooped and looked, and what happened? She sees two Angels robed in white. This is very significant. One at the head and one at the feet of where Jesus had been laying. And they ask why she's weeping and she says it again. They've taken away my Lord and I don't know where they've taken him. But she doesn't go in. The scripture says she stands up and looks around and sees Jesus and she does not know who he is. That is pretty indicative of when Jesus came back from the dead. Some, several times people saw him and did not know who he was. And he asked her the same question, but then he adds something. Why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? She supposes him to be the gardener and says, If you moved him, I will come and take him from you. This is precious, folks. Jesus calls her name as only he could say it. And she knew. In that instant, when he spoke her name, she knew. That tells us some will rejoice. Can you imagine? Someone that you dearly love has been taken from you in death and then three days later you go to put flowers on the cemetery and it's opened up and they're not there. Wouldn't you think somebody took the body too? That's exactly where she's at. 
when he called her by name, Mary. You know, I thought about that, and I thought about that, and, and, and it's, I know it's a silly illustration, but it's, it says everything. Sometimes when Debbie and I have been working late down at the church or some, and we go home and my, my little black dachshund puppy, well, not Toby because he doesn't know anything yet. He's still a youngin'. But Molly, when she hears that door open, she starts barking. But all I got to do is say her name. And that's what Jesus did. He knew when he said that single word, and she turned to him and said, Rabbani, you know what that means? It doesn't mean just teacher. It means most esteemed teacher. She recognized him. She knew who he was. And she's a typical woman. What does she do? She runs and hugs him. <laughs> Wouldn't you? Yeah. Of course you would. She grabs him. Probably squeezing the, the life that he's got out of him now. You know, we've heard that. And Jesus says these words. And I know the King James says, don't touch me. But it is literally, stop clinging to me. And is it a reprimand, you know? Is he getting on to her? No, I think he says it with a smile on his face. You're choking me, Mary. You're squeezing me too hard. Please stop. And then he says these words. I've not yet ascended to my father. What does that, what does that have to do with it? Because he is going to ascend to the father. What's he going to do? He's going to ascend to the father. And he's going to go into the most holy place. In that tabernacle in heaven. And he's going to take blood. Not of a lamb. But of himself. And sprinkle it on the mercy seat. And God will say. Well done. Well done. This is my beloved son. Oh if we could understand how much God the father loves the son. And then what does Mary do? What would you do? <laughs> we would do just what she did, wouldn't we? She then tells the disciples, and I love these words, I have seen the Lord. That changes everything. My question to you, have you seen the Lord? You say, well, where is he? You can only see him with spiritual eyes. You cannot see him physically because he's not here physically he is here spiritually in the person of his spirit have you seen the Lord because the scripture says if you've not seen him you don't know him what do I mean by that Jesus said in John 6 verse 40 this is the will of my father that everyone who sees the son and believes in him will have everlasting life you say how can I see him he's not here you got to see him with spiritual eyes this same Jesus who was crucified and is now alive does something that I cannot do. Of course, he did a lot of things I can't do, but he really does it now. He stands with open arms saying, Come to me, all you who are la labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Will you believe and trust in this one to save you from your sins and make you a new person? That's what he does. Isn't that what the kids sang about this morning? He waits for you because like Mary, he knows your name. That makes it real personal. That he knows my name. And if he would step out of heaven right now and come here, he would know every one of our names. Without a name tag. You're not going to have to wear name tags in heaven. You do know that, don't you? Child of God, He knows your name. Are you living in light of the resurrection? Because, as we sang earlier, because He lived, we can live also. If you're a child of God and you're depressed and you're, you're just tired of life, I hope this day has encouraged you. Because Jesus is willing and ready to give you a fresh touch. Fresh touch. He can and will do that. Just come to him in faith. He'll do the rest. I read a devotional this morning out of an unusual magazine, to say the least, and that's exactly what it was talking about. Because the guy had wrote into this magazine and said, 
here it is Easter Sunday, and I think about what he went through and how unfaithful I am. How can I rejoice? I'll tell you how you can rejoice. Because Jesus doesn't expect us to crawl or to walk before we can crawl. He doesn't. And in this Christian life, you start out slowly and you build up. You've got to, folks. You've got to. There's no shortcuts to maturity, no matter what anybody says. There's no shortcuts to it. It's a long and difficult road. But I'll tell you what. Every turn, every hill is worth it. Because you look back and say, my, how far we have come. That's what he's willing to do this morning. I know it's Easter Sunday. I know this may not be your home church, but I don't care, and I hope you don't either. If God has spoken to your heart, when we sing this morning, would you do what he says? Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for Jesus and his resurrection. Thank you for the Apostle John and his diligence to writing down these details that make this story come alive again. And Lord, we are grateful for his diligence. I pray, Father, if you've spoken to hearts, and I believe you have because you've spoken to mine, would you do what you need to do in each one of our hearts? That's our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 178. 178 is our hymn of commitment. Would you stand with us? to have you sit down if you would we're going to have what we call the Lord's Supper uh, right now or communion and what a great day to have it on Easter Sunday uh, I'll tell you what a very special time to me to be with God's people on this day now I know next Sunday we're going to celebrate the resurrection again and then the Sunday after that we're going to do it again because every Sunday we do that's why we meet on the first day of the week. So, but uh, I'm going to ask the men to come forward that I've asked to help me with this. And we'll try to make it brief so that you can get home. I know a lot of you have family visiting, and, and I certainly appreciate that. Appreciate your, your t attendance this morning. Oh, what a great passage of scripture this is. The Lord said, or Paul, the Apostle Paul said in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread 
and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. I'm going to ask Brother Clark if you would ask the Lord's blessings on the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this opportunity to honor you by taking this bread in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um.